This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tomahall. Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Part Fourth. At Shaston. Whoso prefers either matrimony or other ordinance before the good of man and the plain exigence of charity, let him profess papist or protestant or what he will, he is no better than a Pharisee. J. Milton Chapter 1 Shaston, the ancient British Palador, from whose foundation first such strange reports arise, as Drayton sang it, was, and is, in itself the city of a dream. Vague imaginings of its castle, its three mints, its magnificent absidal abbey, the chief glory of South Wessex, its twelve churches, its shrines, chantries, hospitals, its gabled freestone mansions, all now ruthlessly swept away, throw the visitor, even against his will, into a pensive melancholy, which the stimulating atmosphere and limitless landscape around him can scarcely dispel. The spot was the burial place of a king and a queen, of abbots and abbesses, saints and bishops, knights and squires. The bones of King Edward, the martyr, carefully removed hither for holy preservation, brought Shaston a renown which made it the resort of pilgrims from every part of Europe, and enabled it to maintain a reputation extending far beyond English shores. To this fair creation of the great Middle Age, the dissolution was, as historians tell us, the death knell. With the destruction of the enormous abbey, the whole place collapsed in a general ruin. The martyr's bones met with the fate of the sacred pile that held them, and not a stone is now left to tell where they lie. The natural picturesqueness and singularity of the town still remain. But strange to say, these qualities, which were noted by many writers in ages when scenic beauty is said to have been un unappreciated, are passed over in this, and one of the queerest and quaintest spots in England stands virtually unvisited today. It has a unique position on the summit of a steep and imposing scarp, rising on the north, south, and west sides of the borough out of the deep alluvial vale of Blackmore, the view from the castle green over three counties of verdant pasture, south, mid, and nether Wessex, being as sudden a surprise to the unexpectant traveller's eyes as the medicinal air is to his lungs. Impossible to a railway, it can best be reached on foot, next best by light vehicles, and it is hardly accessible to these but by a, sh a sort of isthmus on the northeast that connects it with the high chalk tableland on that side. Such is, and such was, the now world-forgotten Shaston, or Palador. Its situation rendered water the great want of the town, and within living memory horses, donkeys, and men may have been seen toiling up the winding ways to the top of the height, laden with tubs and barrels filled from the wells beneath the mountain, and hawkers retailing their contents at a price of a half penny a bucketful. This difficulty in the water supply, together with two other odd facts, namely that the chief graveyard slopes up as steeply as a roof behind the church, and that in former times the town passed through a curious period of corruption, conventional and domestic, gave rise to the saying that Shaston was remarkable for three consolations to man, such as the world afforded not elsewhere. It was a place where the churchyard laid nearer heaven than the church steeple, where beer was more plentiful than water, and where there were more wanton women than honest wives and maids. It is also said that after the Middle Ages the inhabitants were too poor to pay their priests, and hence were compelled to pull down their churches, and refrain altogether from the public worship of God, a necessity which they bemoaned over their cups in the settles of their inns on Sunday afternoons. In those days the Shastonians were apparently not without a sense of humor. There was another peculiarity, this a modern one, which Shaston appeared to owe to its site. It was the resting place and headquarters of the proprietors of wandering vans, shows, shooting galleries, and other itinerant concerns, whose business lay largely at fairs and markets. As strange wild birds are seen assembled on some lofty promontory, meditatively pausing for longer flights, or to return by the course they followed thither, so here in this cliff town stood in stullified silence the yellow and green caravans bearing names not local, as if surprised by a change in the landscape so violent as to hinder their further progress, 
and here they usually remained all the winter till they turned to seek again their old tracks in the following spring. It was to this breezy and whimsical spot that Jude ascended from the nearest station for the first time in his life about four o'clock one afternoon, and entering on the summit of the peak after a toilsome climb, passed the first houses of the aerial town, and drew towards the schoolhouse. The hour was too early, the pupils were still in school, humming small like a swarm of gnats, and he withdrew a few steps along Abbey Walk, whence he regarded the spot which fate had made the home of all he loved best in the world. In front of the schools, which were extensive and stone-built, grew two enormous beeches with smooth mouse-colored trunks, as such trees will only grow on chalk uplands. Within the mullioned and transomed windows he could see the black, brown, and flaxen crowns of the scholars over the sills, and to pass the time away he walked down to the level terrace where the abbey gardens once had spread, his heart throbbing in spite of him. Unwilling to enter till the children were dismissed, he remained here till young voices could be heard in the open air, and girls in white pinafores over red and blue frocks appeared dancing along the paths, which the abbess, prioress, sub-prioress, and fifty nuns had demurely paced three centuries earlier. Retracing his steps, he found that he had waited too long, and that Sue had gone out into the town at the heels of the last scholar. Mr. Phillotson, having been absent all the afternoon at a teacher's meeting at Shotsford. Jude went into the empty schoolroom and sat down. The girl who was sweeping the floor having informed him that Mrs. Phillotson would be back again in a few minutes. A piano stood near, actually the old piano that Phillotson had possessed at Marygreen, and though the dark afternoon almost prevented him seeing the notes, Jude touched them in his humble way and could not help modulating into the hymn which had so affected him in the previous week. A figure moved behind him, and thinking it was still the girl with the broom, Jude took no notice, till the person came close and laid her fingers lightly upon his base hand. The imposed hand was a little one he seemed to know, and he turned. "'Don't stop,' said Sue. "'I like it. I learnt it before I left Milchester.' They used to play it in the training school. I can't strum it before you. Play it for me. Oh, well, I don't mind. Sue sat down, and her rendering of the piece, though not remarkable, seemed divine as compared with his own. She, like him, was evidently touched, to her own surprise, by the recalled air. And when she had finished, and he moved his hand towards hers, it met his own halfway. Jude grasped it, just as he had done before her marriage. It is odd, she said, in a voice quite changed, that I should care about that air, because... Because what? I am not that sort, quite... Not easily moved? I didn't quite mean that. Oh, but you are one of that sort, for you are just like me at heart, but not at head. She played on and suddenly turned around, and by an unpremeditated instinct each clasped the other's hand again. She uttered a forceful little laugh as she relinquished his quickly. How funny, she said. I, I wonder what we both did that for. I suppose because we are both alike, as I said before. Not in our thoughts, perhaps a little in our feelings. And they rule thoughts. Isn't it enough to make one blaspheme that the composer of that hymn is one of the most commonplace men I have ever met? What, you know him? I went to see him. Oh, you goose, to do just what I should have done. Why did you? Because we are not alike, he said dryly. Now we'll have some tea, said Sue. Shall we have it here instead of in my house? It is no trouble to get the kettle and things brought in. We don't live at the school, you know, but in that ancient dwelling across the way called Old Grove Place. It is so antique and dismal that it depresses me dreadfully. Such houses are very well to visit, but not to live in. I feel crushed into the earth by the weight of so many previous lives there spent. In a new place like these schools, there is only your own life to support. Sit down, and I'll tell Ada to bring the tea things across. He waited in the light of the stove, the door of which she flung open before going out, and when she returned, followed by the maiden with tea, they sat down by the same light, assisted by the blue rays of a spirit lamp under the brass kettle on the stand. "'This is one of your wedding presents to me,' she said, signifying the latter. "'Yes,' said Jude. 
the kettle of his gift sang with some satire in its note to his mind, and to change the subject he said, Do you know of any good readable edition of the uncanonical books of the New Testament? You don't read them in the school, I suppose. Oh, dear, no, t'would alarm the neighborhood. Yes, there is one. I am not familiar with it now, though I was interested in it when my former friend was alive. Cowper's Apocryphal Gospels. That sounds like what I want. His thoughts, however, reverted with a twinge to the former friend, by whom she meant, as he knew, the university comrade of her earlier days. He wondered if she talked of him to Phillotson. The Gospel of Nicodemus is very nice, she went on to keep him from his jealous thoughts, which she read clearly, as she always did. Indeed, when they talked on an indifferent subject as now, there was ever a second silent conversation passing between their emotions. So perfect was the reciprocity between them. It is quite like the genuine article, all cut up into verses, too, so that it is like one of the other evangelists read in a dream, when things are the same, yet not the same. But, Jude, do you take an interest in those questions still? Are you getting up apologetica? Yes, I am reading divinity harder than ever. She regarded him curiously. Why do you look at me like that, said Jude? Oh, why do you want to know? I am sure you can tell me anything I might be ignorant of in that subject. You must have learned a lot of everything from your dear dead friend. We won't get on to that now, she coaxed. Will you be carving out at that church again next week where you learnt the pretty hymn? Yes, perhaps. That will be very nice. Shall I come and see you there? It is in this direction I could come any afternoon by train for half an hour. No, don't come. What, aren't we going to be friends then any longer, as we used to be? No. I didn't know that. I thought you were always going to be kind to me. No, I am not. What have I done, then? I am sure I thought we, too. The tremulo of her voice caused her to break off. Sue, I sometimes think you are a flirt, said he abruptly. There was a momentary pause till she suddenly jumped up, and to his surprise he saw by the kettle flame that her face was flushed. I can't talk to you any longer, Jude, she said, the tragic contralto note having come back as of old. It is getting too dark to stay together like this, after playing morbid Good Friday tunes that make one feel what one shouldn't. We mustn't sit and talk in this way any more. Yes, you must go away, for you mistake me. I am very much the reverse of what you say so cruelly. Oh, Jude, it was cruel to say that. Yet I can't tell you the truth. I should shock you by letting you know how I give way to my impulses, and how much I feel that I shouldn't have been provided with attractiveness unless it were meant to be exercised. Some women's love of being loved is insatiable, and so often is their love of loving. And in the last case they may find they can't give it continuously to the chamber officer appointed by the bishop's license to receive it. But you are so straightforward, Jude, that you can't understand me. Now you must go. I'm sorry my husband is not at home. Are you? I perceive I have said that in mere convention. Honestly, I don't think I am sorry. It doesn't matter. Either way, sad to say. As they had overdone the grasp of hands some time sooner, she touched his fingers but lightly when he went out now. He had hardly gone from the door when, with a dissatisfied look, she jumped up on a form and opened the iron casement of a window beneath which he was passing in the path without. "'When do you leave here to catch your train, Jude?' she asked. He looked up in some surprise. "'The coach that runs to meet it goes in three-quarters of an hour or so. What will you do with yourself for the time?' Oh, wander about, I suppose. Perhaps I shall go and sit in the old church. It does seem hard of me to pack you off so. You have thought enough of churches, heaven knows, without going into one in the dark. Stay there. Where? Where you are. I can talk to you better like this than when you were inside. It was so kind and tender of you to give up half a day's work to come to see me. You are Joseph the dreamer of dreams, dear Jude, and a tragic Don Quixote. And sometimes you are St. Stephen, who, while they are stoning him, could see heaven opened. Oh, my poor friend and comrade, you'll suffer yet. Now that the high window sill was between them so that he could not get at her, she seemed not to mind indulging in a frankness she had feared at closer quarters. 
I have been thinking, she continued, still in the tone of one brimful of feeling, that the social molds civilization fits us into have no more relation to our actual shapes than the conventional shapes of the constellations have to the real star patterns. I am called Mrs. Richard Phillotson, living a calm, wedded life with my counterpart of that name. But I am not really Mrs. Richard Phillotson, but a woman tossed about, all alone, with aberrant passions and unaccountable antipathies. Now you mustn't wait longer, or you will lose the coach. Come and see me again. You must come to the house, then. Yes, said Jude. When shall it be? Tomorrow week. Goodbye. Goodbye. She stretched out her hand and stroked his forehead pitifully, just once. Jude said goodbye and went away into the darkness. Passing along Bimport Street, he thought he heard the wheels of the coach departing, and, truly enough, when he reached the Duke's arms in the marketplace, the coach had gone. It was impossible for him to get to the station on foot in time for his train, and he settled himself perforce to wait for the next, the last to Melchester that night. He wandered about a while, obtained something to eat, and then, having another half hour on his hands, his feet involuntarily took him through the venerable graveyard of Trinity Church, with its avenues of limes, in the direction of the schools again. They were entirely in darkness. She had said she lived over the way in Old Grove Place, a house which she soon discovered from her description of its antiquity. A glimmering candlelight shone from a front window, the shutters being yet unclosed. He could see the interior clearly, the floor sinking a couple of steps below the road without, which had become raised during the century since the house was built. Sue, evidently just come in, was standing with her hat on in this front parlor or sitting room, whose walls were lined with wainscoting of paneled oak reaching from floor to ceiling the latter being crossed by huge molded beams only a little way above her head. The mantelpiece was of the same heavy description, carved with Jacobean pilasters and scrollwork. The centuries did, indeed, ponderously overhang a young wife who passed her time here. She had opened a rosewood workbox and was looking at a photograph. Having contemplated it a little while, she pressed it against her bosom and put it again in its place. Then, becoming aware that she had not obscured the windows, she came forward to do so, candle in hand. It was too dark for her to see Jude without, but he could see her face distinctly, and there was an unmistakable tearfulness about the dark, long-lashed eyes. She closed the shutters, and Jude turned away to pursue his solitary journey home. Whose photograph was she looking at, he said. He had once given her his, but she had others, he knew. Yet it was his, surely. He knew he should go to see her again, according to her invitation. Those earnest men he read of, the saints whom Sue, with gentle irreverence, called his demigods, would have shunned such encounters if they doubted their own strength, but he could not. He might fast and pray during the whole interval, but the human was more powerful in him than the divine. End of chapter 1